welcome to this week's program. We're going to be doing an update on the deer industry. We're going to find out about the course that everybody does at Lincoln and why. And we're also going to be talking farm accounting, but in just a moment, it's cropping. Dennis Roadsides, a bit of a potential problem there. Absolutely, Rob. Um, the district councils have thought they're doing a great job in, in clearing uh, vegetation from the sides of the roads and just exposing shingle, which obviously uh, if you drift off the side of the road and go into shingle, you have more control than if you drift off the road and go into slippery white clover, something like that. <laughs> but what they've forgotten is uh, what comes next. And of course, um, the, the Tar Seal roads uh, with the camber on them are brilliant um, area for catchment for, for rain or even dews and, and, um, or even one mill and, and all that lovely water runs to the side of the road and it's one of the most fertile spots in the country. It gets irrigation where there is no irrigation because it just runs mm, there mm, mm. and if there happened to be fertiliser truck whizzing past all sorts of things. It's a very, very fertile area and of course um, up springs things that were underneath that layer, things like uh, wild turnip, things like wild carrot, potentially um, wild radish. Um, so automatically you have, if it's not controlled with, with a herbicide, you've got potential flowering, you've got potential bees activity, you've got potential cross-pollination. So I would... Wouldn't have thought of it then. No, well, it's something really the councils need to think about is, you know, the consequences of what they do. And, and uh, as farmers, we, we look around for these things, um, knowing that, um, yeah, identifying a risk Mm. Yep. Air plans as far as regional councils? Yes, uh, the Canterbury um, air, air Regional Plan proposed. Um, very, very interesting reading. Some very good information came out from FAR this week on what farmers think they can do, what they can't do, and what they might be able to do, and what could change. And one thing uh, very good coming out of it is that farmers need to actually think about what they're doing in terms of stubble burning. Um, the effect on neighbours, when it's done, uh, wind speeds, things like that, the distance to somebody that you could um, upset their activity. And uh, yes, there will need to be more forms filled out, more things oh, no, done. More compliance. More compliance. Um, we're, we're talking about a minimum, a smoke management, management plan that has to be done by the, um, the land manager and uh, readily available if uh, somebody from ECAN um, comes around. It is all encompassing and quite wide in its scope. If you read some of those conditions there, you're really going to take, it's going to take uh, about five headaches in three days <laughs> okay. to write. How's the harvest going? Because it's been pretty wet and I've seen some crops are going black. Oh, there's been some twitchy farmers out there. There's been some farmers even turn their grass seed with, uh, with hay rakes and uh, albeit very, very slow. And very and gently, Dennis. Very, very gently, um, not to shake any seed out. Some seed is lost, um, but so wet underneath the, uh, the windrows. And farmers do their best to grow a great crop with lots of um, dry matter. And of course, as soon as you windrow it, you bring it into a huge swath. If it rains under there, sometimes that's a benefit. Some of the seed will shell from the top and be caught in the swath. And when you pick it up with, a, with probably a draper, because I don't think... Um, pea lifters would, would get underneath there because it's just too wet. Mm. Um, some of the seed is kept, but on more open crops and Italian type crops, um, the seed just shatters and falls on the ground. And I of mean, course, um, there's got to be a, there's got to be a sort of a minimum moisture level. Though. I mean, how do you get around that? Yes, there's definitely a minimum moisture level and all the drying silos and all the drying floors. I've had quite a few farmers ring me and say, do I know of anybody that hasn't got a drying floor or a drying silo being used? And I've directed them to a few and uh, they're all busy. They're yeah, all busy. Okay. Mm. Now there's got to be some paperwork, more compliance. More compliance, but um, sensible compliance, I believe. <laughs> the, the sort of Carter, I didn't even think you'd say that. <laughs> sensible compliance. Well, some things, you know, you, you need to have an audit trail and things like um, grower declarations that, that that seed came from that field, so forth. Um, tags, certification tags and identification, identification tags need to go with the crops to the, to the dressing stores. Things like uh, spray diaries obviously um, need to be done in terms of uh, food safety and, and traceability. And hygiene checklists for your, for your combine, your equipment, 
your, your storage areas, all those, all of those things are tick, 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 mm -hmm. and and that needs to accompany the the seed for um, identification purposes. Needs to go with the carrier, and uh, that is very sensible compliance. Yep. Yep. Now, of course, we always talk this time of year about settings as far as your combine is concerned. Yes, indeed, and and farmers grow to huge efforts to grow a fantastic crop. The inputs are um, unbelievable. Get it all ready there and uh, stoked up the first um, sunny day with a reasonably low humidity, rush around um, changing combines over, rush into a crop. Uh, most of them have got a pretty good idea of, of, of settings or you can get a setting from the, uh, from the owner's manual. And then um, farmers actually pride themselves in being able to set up their combines in the yard before they even get into the crop. But even during the day when you're harvesting a crop, conditions change and you should change your settings according to those conditions mm. and that includes uh, rotor speed, concave settings, blast, um, all those sorts of things because you want it in the tank. You do want it in the tank. If it's out the back it's gone, um, albeit that it's slightly rough in the tank. Um, you better to get all that seed in there, let the seed dressing stores dress it out. I think uh, there's no medals for the best looking sample. You, okay. You're not a machine dressing plant. You're a you're a combine harvester. You're a combine. Harvester. You're a yeah. combine harvester. Yeah. Yeah. The legal situation about who owns seed or grain until when? Yes, that's quite a complex one and varies between contracts between stores. Um, the issue of insurance, insuring that crop, um, whether it's on your farm, whether it's in transportation, whether it's at the um, seed store. There's no sense in paying double premiums on insurance. But there's also a real need to know about legal ownership and when that changes. Does it change as it, as it goes into the seed store? Does it change once a, um, it is machine dressed? Does it change once a, a purity and germination comes back and complies with the contract? Farmers need to know at what point uh, a lot of farmers feel as soon as they dress it, they deliver that seed to a dressing store, all responsibility is gone. It hasn't. It hasn't. It hasn't thank, gone. Thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we're going to be talking about Lincoln University and a course that everybody has to do, but we find out why. Now, Lincoln University, there's a course that everybody has to do. That's right. Um, it's called Link 101, and basically every first year um, student um, has to do this course. Um, and really the, I guess the aim of the course is that we say to students, you know, although you're all different, doing different degrees, um, the one common thing that you have is that you're all doing land-based degrees. So when you get out into the real world, once you finish your degree, um, you're going to encounter these common challenges, um, global challenges related to basically land use change. Um, so what we do is um, we get a whole lot of experts in from around the university, um, people that are experts in sort of resource management, um, you know, land, people that are experts in sort of um, biophysical elements, co social cultural elements of, of land use. And we get them in and we expose the students to a wide variety of views and perspectives on land use change and um, how you know, those, those issues can really um, um, sort of broaden the students' minds, I guess, um, so that when they get out into the real world, um, they can, um, you know, relate to the wide range of sort of multi-dimensional issues that land use change sort of brings. You know, I think we could all learn from that. We can, um, and actually um, I've learned a lot from it, and a lot of the lecturers that come in have actually learned a lot from the course as well. Um, you know, when you look at a global issue like climate change, um, you know, there's a whole lot of um, dimensions to that issue. It's not just, you know, how the weather changes, but how, you know, different social cultural groups react to that change, um, and how the economics might affect what we do um, in New Zealand. You know, um, I mean, it goes at the heart of what New Zealand does in terms of being an um, agricultural-based export economy. Um, huge um, issues to, to really deal with um, as those students get out into the real world. Climate change. Now, that's something that a lot of people scoff at. Yeah, I think, I think we've passed that. I think on, on the whole, I I hope we have at least. Um, I think you know people are really um, coming to grips with actually those effects are here now, and we're actually having to deal with them right now. So some of the um, lecturers that come in will talk about you know urban development and how already we're seeing um, changes 
and where we plan land use. So, you know, no more sort of urban development around coastal areas that, that are low-lying. Um, we're already seeing changes around, for example, how we manage the lake here in Canterbury, Lake Ellesmere. Um, you know, if climate change, if sea levels rise just a little bit, it really changes how that lake could drain to the sea. Um, so really changing sort of the land use all around that area. Now, you're saying that climate change is real, even though we've got America suffering from the worst snowstorms ever. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, for sure, um, possibly you know, it's been you know, impacted there. Um, but yeah, um, New Zealand will feel those, those changes as well. And as I said, I think everybody would benefit if we did go and cover that course. Straight after the break, we're talking farm accounting. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. We'll get you thinking, think water. I think it's all working well, Jack. <sighs> My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking, think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking, think water. It's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of we'll everything. Get you thinking, think water. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Kerry, standard cost values, first of all, what are they? It's a means of valuing your livestock at the end of the year. So there's obviously five different values that you can use during the year, um, or methods. And this is the first one that the government released the values on. So they've come out in January. So changes or what do we learn from it? Basically they're saying that the costs of growing the animals from sort of baby animals to mature and onwards are about the same as what they were last year. There's sort of a 1-7% to 7 change, except for your rising two dairy heifers. Um, they've said the cost of those have gone up by 50%, which was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> it's the only one that's really stood out. That's, that's a big big chunk. Yeah, so they've obviously taken the cost of all the hay and baleage and Because of the drought and because of the Yeah, and I think feeding. that's feeding through to it now, so that's the one that's really stood out, but everything else is pretty much almost similar to last year. How do we use that for our tax? Basically, when you go in and see your accountant, you give them a bit of an idea of what you're doing for the next two or three years, and they'll look at whether this is the best scheme for you or whether one of the others. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of factors to be taken into it. So it's not exactly, you should use this, there's no answer like that, it's a combination of, of factors. And you basically interview them and say, and, yeah. and say well, please yeah, you find, The first thing you've got to find is what your plans are. You've got to tell your accountant what you're going to do in the next two or three years because they've got to then consider the implications of moving from one scheme to another and whether you can even do it. So yeah. the more you can tell them, the better. Brings us really to the payout. 
and the options and they're getting fewer and fewer. Yeah, it's pretty grim with the latest release on what they're going to do to it. Um, the reality for most farmers now is that they get out of bed, they're losing money. They actually better to stay in bed because it's not costing them money. Um, it's very, very grim. I get to see the headlines, farmers told to stay in bed. Well, yeah, it's actually cheaper. Um, because you, the moment you get up, you're starting to use your power, your fuel, all those sort of things. So yeah, better to stay in bed and not do anything. Um, you're not losing as much. Would the, the value of the stock, is that likely to, to come down because of people bailing out? Because they if, are bailing out. Yeah, um, it will. Uh, down south, we've got a bank that's actually taking a lot of action against farmers and telling them they've got to sell at the end of the season because they're pulling the funding. And talking, so that's, that's, that's happening? Yep, that's happening out there right now. And talking to a couple of people down that way, they're predicting a sort of in-calf heifer buy, if this happens, be worth 250 to 400 I'm so, speechless. And that's you know, a big drop from the, the money they've paid in the last 18 months, two years, because it'll be just such a glut of them. Um, we know of at least 35 farms that have been told, and they're all carrying sort of 500 to 1,000 cows. So there's going to be some very cheap and but well-bred cows on the yeah, market. Yeah, there is, and the guys that are going to sell up are going to be left with a huge debt, and their only prospect is bankruptcy, because they're not going to be able to afford to pay it, because they're going to be you know, heavily in debt to the bank. The bank are going to want their money, Kerry, this is very heavy stuff. Yeah, this, this bank that started it, and the others haven't come on board yet. Um, we know one bank that's actually trying to help farmers out by giving them funding and getting the swap over where possible, but this one, yeah, they've taken control of farms where they're saying, right, we want to know what bills you've got, and we'll decide who you pay and not pay. So they're taking over literally the, the accounting side? Yeah, they're just... They've, so all the money goes into... All, yep, the, the money area. goes in the account, and then they freeze that money, and the dairy farmer then has to go and talk to the bank manager about what they can do with the money and where they're allowed to spend it. They've even gone as far as to say, right, you've got this model tractor, we think that's overkill for what you do, sell it and get a lower lower model. So the, the banks are running the farms? Yep, they are. They've effectively taken over. Um, in one case, we know there's a, a husband and wife there on a, on a farm. Um, she had a baby a month ago and the managers rang up and said, when is she going to get a job? We what? want her to get a job to help fund the farm because it's not making money and we're not prepared to carry the debt. And That's, she had a baby a month ago? Yeah, a month ago. And when the farmer said that, and he said, well, you'll be able to find someone to look after the baby. We need her to get a, a full-time job because she needs a wage to, for you to stay on that farm. Well, I mean, that, to get a nanny is going to cost probably what she's going to get. Ex out, exactly, yeah. Yep. But that's the attitude they're taking. They've come down very, very hard. You know, now, you're talking one bank, and no, we don't need to know who it is, but other banks are likely to, to follow. If one's taking this, there's got, it's only going to be a matter of time. Um, we know at least one is not going to do it. They're, they're hanging in there. Um, they are real focused and they are wanting to help but, these guys but out. Kerry, but what options do the banks have apart from that? Because they, if, you know, if, I, if I've got a debt of whatever it is and I can't service it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah, a ticking I, I just, time bomb. Yeah, I don't know why they're doing it. Obviously, someone in the head office has hit a switch. And a lot of the managers that are making these calls have never even been near a farm. I know I have two managers, they're 25 year olds, not long out of university. They've been educated in Auckland, moved down to the Southland and told, right, go and deal with all these dairy farmers. So you, the, some of the bank managers are sitting around the table and redoing and redoing and redoing budgets. Yep, they're looking at the budgets. They've wiped the value of, of herds down, so equities disappeared overnight. They've just made an arbitrary decision, right, we think the herd was, you know, might have worth, say, 400 or 500,000. We think it's worth 200 now. So your equities just disappeared. So you're right on the borderline in terms of the loan limits now. And, and they just won't extend the funding. So how does the bank survive when that, when that debt isn't paid and they go bankrupt? They're just hopeful that you know, they're going to recover their money one way or another. Um, I don't think it's a smart move on their part. It's just, it just makes it worse than what it is. But they've obviously felt like they've got an overexposure somewhere along the line. Yeah, yeah. So somebody so, sitting around a board table is super overexposed. Fix yeah, it. and they've hit the southland area. Like in Canterbury, it's hardly a word of it. But down south... And what bank. about the Waikato and... Yeah, it's all, all just ticking along. The banks are trying to support them. They've just put, picked on this one region for some reason. And I don't know why. <laughs> no, <laughs> and they want to know why themselves in Southland, I yeah. would have thought. Yeah, well, the dairy farmers are just beside themselves. You know, they just, they've lost control. They... Is it dairy farmers or is it... Dairy sheer farmers and both? sheer milkers, both. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, they've just gone heavy-handed. I'm, as I said, I've just gone sort of cold, really, yeah. because th that's going to be a lot of families and a lot of people who 
They've got a lot of debt that they've got to pay off yep. on wages. Yeah, exactly. Well, they've been, like, they've, for example, they've been telling them to fire staff and do it all yourself. Well, sometimes you need the staff because you can't do it on your own. Mm. But they and don't care. Um, and I've like, talked to a debt collector yesterday um, down that way, and he said that he's two or three occasions he's seen, when he's been to a farm, um, he's seen other people come in and they've just picked up the vehicles and driven them away because they don't want to take the risk with the bank and left the poor farm with nothing. It's very grim. So this is going right back to the mid-80s or early 80s when we had that drought and the same thing was happening. Yeah, yeah, way back, sort of repeating itself. Kerry, that's really, really sad, but we'll keep monitoring it if we may. Mm, yes. And um, yeah, I know that you and other chartered accountants are one of the first stops that people should make and they should talk to you and then take you in to talk to the bank manager. Kerry, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, on a brighter note, we're going to be having a look at the dairy industry, which I understand is doing a lot better than dairy. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. We'll get you thinking, think water. I think it's all working well, Jack. <sighs> My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking, think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking, think water. It's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of everything. We'll get you thinking, think water. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. The deer industry is looking pretty promising. It is, Rob. It is. I think the deer industry this year, 2016, is going to be one of uh, one of definitely one of the better years. We've got some great venison prices. Um, velvet prices are, are stepping up, not not at the highest, but very good. Um, and then the the trophy industry is very well. The harvesting and the trophy business will be very well. So, I think it's going to be one of our better years, 2016. Now, how did you get into deer farming? I mean, you're a, you're a guy that sells cars and trucks and V8 motors and bits. Uh, well, it, it steps back uh, about 15 years ago. My my um, cousin's into the farming business, and uh, we were sitting there one time having a drink after some motor racing, actually. And um, he said about it had his property there, beautiful place. I said, we need some deer out there. And he goes, well, yeah, you buy the deer and we'll use our property. So it went from there to now being a, um, not quite a hobby anymore, that's for sure. So you're stud farming? We are, yes. Our, our main program in, is for us to, to breed some good, uh, good uh, deer for trophy and for the harvesting of that for the trophy business, so, and velvet. So we, we work on both that, trophy and velvet. 
Well, they go hand in hand, surely, because it's all to do with antlers. They do to a certain degree. Um, with, with the velvet, you want uh, good, good weight and good length. Um, whereas with the trophy, you're after uh, multiple points. So a wee bit different, a wee bit different in the breeding, breeding program, but uh, reasonably similar. So you obviously hand pick which animals are going to go velvet and which ones are going to go antler. We do, yeah, we do try to try to weed that out at the two year mark on um, if they're going to be a good trophy or if they're going to be good velvet. And then if they're not going to be good in a trophy program, then a lot of times that they'll, they'll go into the venison program. So um, yeah, we're a bit of a juggle and, and it's hard to pick at that early stage too. You can run them through the three and four year old and they, they blossom, but uh, nine times out of 10, two to three year olds, you can pick your, pick your weights and decide which plot, slot they go into. Top of the line, Grant, though, they're getting some pretty good prices. They are, Rob. This year's been pretty amazing. Um, some of the sales throughout New Zealand, they're um, getting up to, you know, $130,000, $140,000 for some of these top three-year-olds. Um, very good for the industry, really good for the deer industry um, to see people are so positive and paying those prices for some pretty amazing animals. And the females, are they attracting good attention? Absolutely, yeah, the hinds, the, 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 uh, the hind program is going really well and um, I wasn't at all the auctions this year but I could see from, um, from our feedback that the prices were still very strong there and um, it's the, it's the uh, genetic mix that you've got to have spot on and getting that good hind and that good stag group is, is the key to the good success and seeing some of these animals now getting up to 800 inches. Um, you know, years ago having a 500 inch animal was the, was the, the goal and the key but now it's, that's, that's the norm. Um, these guys are now getting some amazing, amazing inches out of the animals that's for sure. Now the trophy industry had a wee bit of a cloud over it because people didn't really totally understand it but it's gone mainstream now. Well, Rob, I, as I say to people, in, in the trophy industry, that animal gets looked after the best, better than any other animal in, that, that I, I'm aware of, as it's well brought up, it's well looked after, it's fed with the best possible feed, and uh, like I saw, we, have, we do have an end, um, but it's, it may be on a, on a nice sunny slope there. They're really well looked after, so people's perception of anything else is, is not 100% by any means. Well, compared to going f to a slaughterhouse, for the want of a better term, it's, it's got to be a nicer way to go. Well, that's true. You know, we have the, the sheep and cattle and everything that go through that, that, that normal process. Um, so being well looked after, well fed, and um, crikey, some of the farmers, because the values of these things, are, I think they all but sleep in the shed with them sometimes to look after those animals. So they definitely would get looked after. So the season's been kind? The season's been good so far. Um, you know, we're, we're you know, uh, moving into sort of mid-January at the moment. We've got some good growth. We've had some great inches of rain in, in the Canterbury, and North Canterbury area, South Canterbury. Um, so, so far, so good. We'll keep our fingers crossed, but uh, yeah, I'd, li I'd like to think we can continue on. I think they're talking southern in the next few days, bit of rain, so we'll cross fingers, keep that northwest away. Now I know that you did a lot of work helping for North Canterbury farmers and doing all sorts of wonderful things. The latest thing is looking at share farming. Yes, um, well that's, a, that's a, a thing that's been really well followed up by the Rural Support Trust is the share farming program through the north and south. Um, with the North Canterbury farmers having, having a, a bulk of their great stock that they don't want to get rid of and working together to, with our South Island, with the, sorry, with the South Canterbury farmers, if they've got some area down there, I know that they sure want to know about it. And um, so if there's anybody down there that can call get up to the north, uh, get the north guys down there, be perfect, you know. So, yeah, the share farming, great idea. Love it. And it is rather good that Grant can say that the deer industry is rolling along quite nicely. We've got more for you on the land very shortly. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good.
I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. We'll get you thinking, think water. I think it's all working well, Jack. <sighs> My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking, think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking, think water. It's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of everything. We'll get you thinking, think water. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet. To feed the world. To protect the future. To live well. To be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Warwick the season, it's been an interesting one really. It has Rob, yep, and I mean who would have known two months ago we were supposed to, in Canterbury anyway, be in the middle of a jolly drought and we've had I think in January more rain than we've ever had. Um, it's looking a picture, it's uh, I was talking to one of my neighbours the other day and he said it's the spring that we didn't get. So That's a there you are. Actually. <laughs> so, a um, no, it's, it's brilliant. If you're a pastoral farmer, um, it's a fantastic season. If you're a cropping farmer, um, there's quite a few worrying signs on, you know, in terms of trying to get the crops dry, trying to get them mature, and thirdly, trying to control the jolly weeds that are coming up through them. So, uh, the, second, the second growth. So, um, the situation is that there's been quite a lot of the early brassicas and some of the early perennial ryegrass has been harvested and quality seems to be pretty good. Um, there's not a lot of cereals done, um, but I know further south in South Canterbury, for example, they had, a, they had 100 mils of rain in one dollop in January and that did cause quite a bit of sprout in the did wheat it? and yep. in the barley. So. Yeah, some quality aspects I think will be a bit of a concern um, and we just need another two or three weeks of fine weather and that will make a big difference. Because that really will, won't it? A bit of warmth. Oh, hell yes. And I mean, really the important thing for us now is, is to have the, uh, you know, the right conditions to get that moisture down in, the, in those crops because harvesting at high moisture contents creates another problem and downstream we'll have problems with vigour and with germination and some of those problems, yeah. What, what's the scene globally? Because you've got your finger on the pulse. Um, well, of course, uh, they're in the middle of winter and it's been quite interesting. I know in most of Western Europe they've had an extremely dry winter until basically this last month and all of a sudden winter's appeared. Um, the sentiment, I think, is quite cautious and quite, um, quite uh, well, yes, there's a fair level of caution, might I say. Uh, the wheat price is down, so arable crops uh, are reduced in price. Um, if you look at livestock, well, of course, the Europeans are um, clearly making hay while the sun shines in terms of milk production, because mm -hmm. their milk production is well up, and that's obviously having some effect on us if, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, you, yeah. if, if, if you look at, it, at the global situation. 
But from a seed business perspective, um, I think there, it's, it's still quite positive. Um, there are people buying seed and trading seed, and there seems to be good market demand in a number of the overseas countries. So that's very positive. So the seed industry is still in pretty good heart. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, um, I mean, clearly, I think, uh, I mean, in our own circumstance, uh, you know, we've, we've had a pretty good year in terms of uh, seed sales, like the spring, a lot of uh, fodder beet went in the ground, um, and a lot of demand for those sort of crops. Um, quite a lot of repasturing in, in the southern half of the South Island, because, uh, you know, it's principally a spring sowing season. Um, I think we're all awaiting the autumn uh, because we're, we've got to take account of the fact that the dairy, our, our dairy farmers are under you know, significant financial pressure yeah, huge and, pressure, really. uh, and they're really having to limit their spend. But um, we're trying to encourage them to, to really look at if they are going to spend, spend on things that are of a productive, positive outcome. So like some pasture, uh, you know, you plant and renew your pasture, well, you're going to get a positive outcome of that mm, in mm, terms of mm. more feed going down the track. So, you know, I, I totally support perhaps um, those sort of initiatives. And, but obviously capital expenditure will be things that they'll ease, have to ease back on because, um, you know, you, you just haven't got the money to go around. Is there still in the seed industry a lot of R&D going on? Yes, there is. Um, I, think, I think a lot of our R&D... In, in the New Zealand and Australian context, uh, certainly in New Zealand is more related to the, to the application or the applied R&D. Um, there is quite a lot of work going on in plant breeding to, to look at improving uh, endophytes, to improve uh, quite a lot of the forage quality aspects of grass. So yes, there is quite a lot going on, but I'd have to say probably to be fair, the government investment in forage R&D is significantly reduced and so it's the private sector that is largely having to pick that up. Yeah and then of course they've got to try to get that back don't they because yep. you can't do it yep. you can't do it as a lost cause. And that that's probably why the research tends to be more applied. Uh, the blue sky stuff that you and I might uh, want to see in 10 years time is probably under a fair level of funding pressure. So, but a lot of the applied applied R and D, you know, how you take a product and you apply it in an agricultural sense, is still happening. Yeah. I'm, I'm quietly amused, but in a nice way, that yeah. you guys, Seed Force, have fodder, beet, Coxford, chicory. You picked on some old-fashioned stuff, modified it to make it fit, and it's working really well. Well, it's it's about uh, I, I I think New Zealand. If, if I look at it pastorally, New Zealand agriculture has become very, very dependent on ryegrass white clover. Nothing wrong with that, but there are other species. If you look at resilience in your pastures and want to have a have, have a real, a real uh, extremely um, competent, strong pasture that's going to last for a number of years, you've got to look beyond ryegrass mm. because ryegrass got some some deficiencies, and. And so Coxford, yes, some of the new breeding that's been done, um, RAGT, our, our partner in France, is probably world leading in terms of the quality of those sort of that, that species. So we're trying to integrate those into our pasture systems. And sub clover is another one that's coming back that uh, was forgotten about. Yeah, but that's it's, right. I it's got a lot of potential and, mm. um, and it'll persist in sort of the harder, drier situations a lot better than white clover will. So we're seeing farmers starting to accept and understand more how they can bring these pasture species into an overall pasture mix. How and of course, fodder beet, well, <laughs> fodder beet's old technology, Rob. Yeah, I it's know, old, but God, it works. <laughs> it's, it's, it's old technology that's, that's basically been um, wound up again. Yeah. And it, the key point of difference has been in Europe, it was used in a cut and carry system, quite expensive. We've taken it and adopted it into a pastoral feeding in situ situation. And yes, we've had to transition animals, and yes, we've had to understand how to work it and how to make it make it uh, effectively utilisable. 
but it's been a success story. It's what phenomenal Kiwi, success. It's story. what Kiwis do. We take yep. a good thing and we make it a lot better. Warren. And you'd be amazed how uh, much inquiry we've had from places like South America, like the US. Oh, shivers! We've heard about your uh, this fodder beet. We've seen it being used in grazing situations. How do we do it? Wouldn't <laughs> mind to do that. <laughs> Excellent. Same old thing, eh? Warwick, thank you very much indeed. Yes. Straight after the break, we're going to be talking about the drought with our Rex Plastics. Be active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be active amino acid biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's be active amino acid biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Phil, it's been promised as a long, hot, dry summer, and even though we've had a bit of rain, it's still biting. Uh, absolutely, Rob. Um, the view was that El Nino was going to bring extraordinarily dry conditions. It's almost the biggest on record in terms of El Ninos. Um, and certainly dry is something that is true of most of the eastern parts of New Zealand. There was rain in November, there was rain in uh, January, a little bit in December, but still not enough. I mean, conditions are still very dry out there. But it's greened up, which must confuse some people. They're trying. Uh, even though uh, grass is green, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually productive. Uh, it can be green without actually doing anything, and that's one of the risks that we currently run is that people look at the grass and say, oh, well, it's green. Mm. It doesn't mean that when you actually have livestock eat that, that in fact you're going to get production coming back. One of the things flying over Canterbury is you see these huge rings. You don't need to have irrigation just going in circles. No, well, that comes back very much to the cost of land. Uh, land, land is an expensive uh, asset for any farm, uh, and there are a number of uh, opportunities now to fill in those corner spaces uh, to actually cover the piece of land 100% in terms of irrigation uh, and that then means that in fact it's all productive and really you shouldn't see the round circles of a pivot you should actually see an entire property being green and productive. You don't sow a paddock in a circle you do it in a square or an oblong. Yes yeah, certainly uh, you know, we're in a position now where, in fact, uh, with modern irrigation techniques, we can actually cover every last piece of that land. Um, and certainly the opportunity exists. We've got products that fit very nicely into that. Lots of pivot corners have been done in the past with K-Line, and that's very effective. Uh, and, of course, we've now got uh, G-Set irrigation, which covers situations where labour's not as plentiful. plentiful. Uh, we can do G-set in corners and unusual shapes 
Uh, every one of those is individually controlled. We can uh, ramp up the amount of water or diminish it. Uh, very, very effective. So you can do directional? To a degree as well. Um, so I mean, there are lots of possibilities. Phil, we've come a long way with irrigation. And there's still a long way to go. Um, Kaline, over many, many years, has uh, had some poor management along the way of some farmers where they've actually over-irrigated. Uh, we can see a time where irrigation control will come into Kaline, uh, where we can uh, measure the amount of water applied and the amount of water actually absorbed into the soil. So the future is very, very bright for the irrigation industry and for RX as a result of that. K-Line used to be scoffed at by some people, but it's really come into its own now, hasn't it? It's gone mainstream. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's all about uh, earning the most off the land. Uh, it's one of the highest assets you have, and it's a matter of getting the best return from all of those areas. And k has fitted very well into that over a long time. Uh, and it's relatively inexpensive on capital as well, so that really does give it great opportunity. Is GSET catching on? Uh, GSET's actually doing reasonably well. Um, it's always difficult when you have a product which is relatively high capital cost. Uh, it doesn't fit every situation. Something that's low capital cost fits everywhere. Um, so uh, the future's good for GSET. It takes some time, however, for people to accept that um, solid set uh, is, a, is a reasonable solution for those areas. Um, so time tells all stories, but it's going very, very well. Now I guess there's a set up time, do you have to give it much lead? The reality is that it's going to take time to do the design for the system and the implementation. Uh, that's always, always in the back of your mind, so uh, it's not an instant fix. Um, usually you're looking at a three month lead time to actually get that product installed uh, from the start of the design through to implementation. Roddy, funeral directors, we never think of health and safety as an issue, but apparently it is going to become one. Yeah, normally we are the end of the line. The health and safety issues have taken care of themselves. Now, the new act that's coming in in April, it's going to have implications for everybody. And the interesting thing is that current, under current legislation, uh, particularly in cemetery sites in the city now, we are responsible. So essentially, the, uh, once the sexton has dug the grave and the funeral company arrives from the point until the grave is refilled, uh, we're responsible for the site and the, the health and safety of that site. And the interesting thing is that like funerals, they're family events, there's lots of little children running around and so they should because uh, cemeteries are essentially a green space so they should be a, a sort of a, a free for all in that sense. But if something happens under the new legislation, we will be liable. And so I think, unfortunately, like all legislation, it's going to catch people in situations that uh, funeral directors may or may not be prepared to take on. Uh, for instance, might be filling in the family grave, which happens regularly. Uh, folks, particularly um, with Pacific funerals, uh, Māori funerals, the grave is filled in traditionally by sons, daughters even, or whoever, just mm -hmm. the general um, crowd. If someone hurts themselves doing that, who is liable? Like puts their back up because they're, they're shoveling and twisting. Well, exactly. And so is ACC then going to lay the responsibility on the funeral director? Is the new act going to catch us in ways? And so these are all questions that most people won't think of them. And to be honest, we've never, you know, in the, the, the 30 or 40 years in our team of experience, we've never had to consider and we've never worried about it. But I think there are going to be some changes. And I think also from a, a rural perspective, with the new birth, uh, sorry, with the new burial and cremation act that is currently going through the house, there's going to be some freedoms opened up, which is a wonderful thing. Um, particularly woodland burials is going to be looked at. The ability to be buried on your own land uh, is going to be loosened up. Um, these That's are all good. things that the, that the public have asked for, and mm. we're totally supportive of. But the question then becomes: if you then add the new OSH regulations in who's responsible on the land, who is looking after everybody. So I think a lot of the, unfortunately, we're becoming more regulated. But <laughs> You're also, not on your own, Roddy. <laughs> no, we're not. And, and it is, these are things that we never thought we'd get caught up in, but yeah. we are worried about it. And we are concerned, particularly in our funeral homes now, um, we often deal with people that are heavy, literally as 
society seems to progress, we're all getting heavier, and so for us lifting uh, the deceased is a big issue. Um, and in our particular firm, we've had to use a forklift on a number of occasions. And so all sorts of things that used to be um, that we just dealt with, now we have to consider the health of our staff and whether or not we can do certain things. And we've always been service providers. Our family says, look, we want you to stand upside down on your heads in the corner of the gravestone wearing stripy pants. We said, absolutely, ma'am, we'll be happy to do it, and here's the bill. Yeah, um, exactly. Nowadays, yeah. it's going to be, no, we can't do that. And we feel, particularly in the funeral industry, that we are there to provide, you know, within legal and moral ethical boundaries, whatever the family wants, because mm. it is a one opportunity they have to, uh, to I, I guess, close a circle on someone's life. And so what we're a little bit sad about is that we're going to have to start saying no, that no, you can't have your three-year-old child within so many metres of an open grave because if they fall in, I'm now liable. Um, or if someone puts their back out doing lifting um, grandma from the car, to onto the hay bales that we're going to set up, or, or whatever the case whatever, may be, because there is there yeah. are no rules. Are no, there? there are no rules, and as we become regulated, rules happen. And I think this is the unfortunate catch-all. Um, and a lot of us are sitting there going, "What does it mean for us? What does it mean for families?" And I think I say, the most important thing, from what I've seen of, of your team, is that the family is first, second, third, and fourth. Absolutely, and like I say, within reason, we'll do whatever we possibly can to ensure that their celebration, whatever shape that takes, is going to be what they want it to happen. But I think also the conversation needs to be had before people die. Because mm -hmm. we get this a lot that, oh, we want to do this, this and this, but there's no opportunity to put measures in place. And like all, all problems, there's always a solution, and the solution is to discuss that in advance. And so I think um, one of the things we're encouraging people is to come to us well in advance of when they need us and say, look, we're thinking we'd like to do these things. And then we can go to them and go, you know, that's absolutely fine. That one's a wee bit tricky, but you know what? I reckon there's a solution around that. And we, if we go down this road, we can get you a, a package together that will suit you and your family. So I'd like to open the conversation up. Never wanted to do it from a legislative point of view. I want to. I want to open up from the point is that we want to do a wonderful celebration for whoever it might be. Come to us early in the piece, get some ideas, find out what the new regulate because we don't know. No, it, no it's, don't. it's very much a suck it and see scenario because no one's sitting down and, and and thought out every weird thing that can happen. But what we do know is that they're now going to enforce legislation that's in the past we've sort of nod nod, wink wink. <laughs> Do you have any say? I mean, for example, you mentioned the fact that going through Parliament now is some discussions about burial, yeah. burial on, on, on our own land. And who's responsible? Are you able to sort of ask those questions? Well, it's always been the Department of Internal Affairs that has made those decisions. And those decisions have been incredibly slow in to come for families, often too slow to work within a normal funeral time frame. Mm. So that has been the submissions that I think was described by one of the um, the the professors that's looking over it, that um, it's a fragmented act that hasn't aged well. And so they're trying to bring it back into, uh, to make it work for people in a timely fashion, because in the modern world, we need to get things done. We don't have years to decide whether or not Mrs. Smith can be buried on the corner of the local farm or whether or not there's going to be a woodland burial set, set aside. We need those decisions in, in days, um, <coughs> maybe weeks at the outside. So that is going to be sped up. But the problem always is, is that when you, when you change existing legislation, it is the it's the flow on hill, downhill effect. Um, are we in a in a position to to do everything in a legal manner? And if a woodland burial is going to become possible, what are the regulations regarding yeah. and the, who's the going space? to be responsible? And as who's in, responsible? On your own farm. A, a, absolutely. And so, these are the, the sorts of things that we are making submissions. To go to your original question, um, the Funeral Directors Association of New Zealand, uh, with Katrina Shanks at the head, has made a lot of submissions and a lot of very good submissions, and they've looked at a lot of these things. And so, hopefully, the legislation is going to be tailored to take into the what ifs. Um, That's great. But at the same time. Families in New Zealand historically do not have this conversation until it's too late. And exactly. so that's the key. Roddy, thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to have another look at Roddy's interview, go to our website, which is ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Coke Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the programme, but I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye.
Bye now.